to us from God's Word. Thanks, Mansell. Tonight's reading is taken from Colossians, chapter 3, reading from 1 through 17. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, when you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now... You must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which has been renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Greek or Jew circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other, And forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. Amen. This is the word of God. Thanks ever so much, Mansell. Do you remember Candid Camera? Do you remember Candid Camera? I used to love Candid Camera. Uh, I've been searching all week for a clip. Uh, There's lots of clips on YouTube, and uh, I can't find this one. But I remember seeing on Candid Camera when I was a kid... Um, this thing they set up, they always used to set something up, do you remember? And uh, try and get the public doing all sorts of uh, funny things or strange things. And uh, this was a guy walking along a pavement. So he's just minding his own business, he's literally just walking along, and all of a sudden he stops, and he starts looking on the ground. And he just stands there like that, and then he starts really peering. People are passing by, not really interested in what's going on, but gradually one or two stop. And he's still there like this, and he's really looking hard. And and gradually a crowd assembles around him. And eventually what you see is that the guy himself leaves. And the crowd is left there Looking down, searching. It's hysterical. If you find the clip, let me know, because I'd love to watch it. 
It's a good picture of how many people, I think, live their lives today. They're searching for something because they have a sense that there's got to be more to life than just what's going on and more to life than maybe just what they've got. But they don't know where to look. And they'll never find it if they don't know where to look. And we're going to discover this evening, as we continue our series uh, in Colossians, that if you want to break free from your past, where you look is very, very important. And instead of looking down like that guy in the candid camera skit, Paul challenges us, as we'll see in chapter 3, well, to look up. Is this working? Yes. To look up. He goes on. That's what we're going to look at tonight. He then goes on to say, you've got to look out. You've got to look in. And you've got to look around. That's what we're going to see as we continue this series. If you're not up to speed with where we are at the moment, my wife will be glad to know. I'm not going to do a long recap. Um, But maybe you can get that as a download of the internet. As we come to Colossians chapter 3, and I'm grateful to Mansell for reading the whole of that chapter for us, and it may be worthwhile actually if you got a Bible, why don't you open it to Colossians chapter 3, because I think there's some great things for us to note in this passage. You either open it if you've got an app on your phone, or use one of the Bibles that's at the end of the pew if you want, feel free to borrow that. As we come to Colossians chapter 3, we're moving now from doctrine to conduct. This is a very important move that Paul is about to make. He does this. This is a style of writing that he adopts quite a lot. If you read the book of Romans, you'll see that he does it there. For the first 11 chapters, there are rich truths. And then in the final chapters... It's about, okay, how do you live that out? Here's what you believe. How do you live that out? And the same is true of the book of Ephesians. See, what we believe determines our behavior, doesn't it? Would you agree with that? What you believe determines your behavior. So far in Colossians, we've learned that if we get Jesus right... In this Christianity stuff, you get everything else right. If you have a a wrong view of Jesus, you'll find that you get derailed very quickly. So what uh, theologians call Christology, your understanding about Jesus Christ, that's so important. If you think he was just a good man, that will consequently lead you to believe other things and to behave in a certain way. If you believe he's the saviour of the world, then obviously you'll believe other things and that will get you to behave another kind of way. So get Jesus right, you get everything else right. And that's what Paul has been heavily focused on in the first two chapters. We've seen, haven't we, how for Paul, he wants to make it very clear, Jesus is number one. Jesus is supreme. He's the man. Jesus is supreme. Supreme over his creation. We see that in chapter 1. He's supreme over his church. And now we're going to see in chapter 3 and indeed in chapter 4 that he's supreme over those who follow him. A slop. You know, there should be some practical evidences if you surrender your life to Jesus? I want to ask you, seriously, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? See, I think many people today get the wrong notion about this Christianity stuff. They think it's just about knowing your Bible a bit, appreciating that Jesus was a cool dude, and singing a few hymns, going to chapel once a Sunday. If that sums up Christianity, then something's gone wrong. We need to understand so much more. There 
need to be practical evidences that we've surrendered our lives to Jesus, God's Son, the Savior of the world, the Lord of lords and the King of kings. If you and I say we're following Jesus, that's got to show. So what Paul wants to do here, he wants to move us from principle to practice, from what some would say the indicative to the imperatives. It's from the is to the ought. See, it does little good if here at Moriah, for instance, we bang on and on and on and on about declaring and defending the truth. You, you can tut all you like when you read the newspaper and when the news is on. But if you fail to demonstrate in your life that you're a Christian, what does that say? And that's the issue. Paul writing to Titus comments, doesn't he, that some claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. So, in history, what do they call us Christians? The word looks at us and calls us a bunch of hypocrites. That's what they call us. Why? Because we sing nice hymns about God, and we talk about loving one another, and we talk about helping people and all of that, but when we live our lives in the real world, what message do people get? And so they point at us and they say, is that? Christianity? The problem, as one commentator puts it, is that a worshipper could come and bow before an idol, put his offering on the altar, and go back to the same old life of sin. What a person believed had no direct relationship with how they behaved. Does what you believe affect how you behave? Think about it. Does it? Because Christianity is so different from other world religions. Duty is always connected to doctrine. What goes on in here always has to affect this. Do you get that? It, what goes on in here has to affect these. What goes on in here has to affect this. Not the shirt, nice as it is. Your heart. Does what you believe affect how you behave? Paul's been arguing, hasn't he, that we've been set free from the powers around us. Remember how he said Jesus has disarmed them? He's triumphed over them, making a spectacle of them on the cross. Now he tells us that with our freedom comes responsibility. And that responsibility is to live a life honoring to God. God's plan is to first make us new. Then he challenges us to live as new people. In short, by becoming a Christian, you don't need to always be the way you've been. When you come to know Jesus, you can break free from your past. Fellas, you know what I'm talking about better than anybody here. That's the reality. We can break free from our past by coming to Christ. The old, Paul says, has gone. The new has come. Well, I'll just stop there because that's enough for me. I don't know about you, but as I look at my life... Hallelujah. God, nothing would excite you a lot at all, would it? Honestly. Yeah, 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 whatever. It's awesome. When you grasp what being in Jesus means, that this can give you a new hope, give you a future, you will want to honor him. You'll want what you believe up here in your noggin to affect the way you behave day by day. Where are you looking? Too many of us are walking around looking. We are searching. 
We're not quite sure what for, but we're looking. And sometimes other people come alongside us, and they're looking as well. And we're not quite sure what we're going to find. And it's around here somewhere. Well, what is it? I'm not sure what it is, but when I find it, I'll know. And people just do that. Paul says, instead of gazing at the ground, look up. Look up, he says. And that's what I want to explore with you tonight. Look at that little boy. Look up. There we go. Look at this verse. Uh, these two verses, uh, four verses. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above. Not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let's explore this a little bit this evening. I know you want your cup of tea. You'll get it. You haven't got down to Nambi to go back to, so it's all right. This, um, this verse... Uh, these verses, this little section, is, is very, very interesting when you, you start to understand what Paul is trying to do here in Colossians. Um, it actually, the opening bit actually parallels, uh, for those of you who are awake, uh, with what he's already said back in chapter 2, verse 20. Since you died with Christ. See how he starts here? You've been raised with Christ. But back in chapter 2, he says, you died with Christ. We learned the other week that we died to Christ so that we don't have to follow the rules of a hollow and deceptive philosophy. Jesus came and took all that nonsense upon himself and the sin that pollutes us, and he rid the world and us of that. If we come to faith in Jesus, we're set free from that rubbish. We are cleansed. We are made new. We don't have to believe all the horoscope rubbish. You don't need to go for a tarot card reading. You don't need to go to a psychic fair or mystic meg or whatever. You now have Jesus. And Paul says, you know, when you came to Jesus, all that stuff died. You died with Christ. You've got a new life now in Jesus. But chapter 3, verse 1, he says, you didn't just die with Christ, you've been raised with Christ. No, he's still not excited. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Since we've been raised with Jesus... We have a new status. I got a new life when I became a Christian. Yeah. We are born again. You heard people say, you know one of them born again Christians, are you? Yes, I am actually. I am. You can't be a Christian without being born again. It's a bit of the principle behind the old thing. Duh. That's what it's about. We get a new life. My old life, gone. Gone. New life. New life in Jesus. Old has gone. And now, boy, now, I didn't just die to the old way. I've been raised. I've been raised. I've got a new life. I've got a new power source for living. Christians are those who've died with Jesus, been buried with Jesus, and been raised with Jesus to a new life. Have you got a new life? Because if you're sitting there tonight and saying, I haven't got a clue what you're on about, friend, ask yourself, seriously, do you know Jesus? Or is this just religion for you? Is this just something that you, you do? If you come to know Jesus, there's new life. The old can go. You can be set free from all of that. You can be raised with Christ and have a new position. And in that position, you can appropriate these truths. And you have to do it on a daily basis to break free. So he says, look, you've been raised with Christ. Since you've been raised with Christ, he said, set your hearts on things above. 
I'm sure you've heard that phrase that somebody is so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. Yeah? I guess that's possible, but it's more likely today, isn't it? That people are so worldly minded, they're no heavenly good. Dare I say it, that's an accusation against the church of Jesus. I think the church has generally become so worldly focused, it's lost its edge. It doesn't speak out on issues. It doesn't make a difference. The church is largely gagged by itself and doesn't speak up. If we truly set our hearts on things above, well, we will become, as the church of Jesus Christ, filled with power and freedom here on earth. Imagine if the church, imagine if we as Mariah Baptist Church grasp this. If we set our hearts on things above and experience the power and freedom that Paul uh, writes about here. He says, set your hearts on things above. The word set there means to seek something out with a desire to have it. Oh, you, do you do that about things? I do that in a sweet shop. I set my heart on Mars bars. Mm. Especially this week, I tell you, on the diet, but there we go. I didn't break it up at your place, did I? There, see, that was good. Where's Molly? Yeah? You want to know? I did stick to it. So there you go. It, it, it's, it, but have you got that desire? You got that desire to, to possess something. The word set here is in the present tense. It implies that you've got to keep on doing it. It's not a one-off. You didn't just pray a prayer back in 1952 when you became a Christian. No. This is an ongoing, deliberate action of the will. You have to, day after day after day after day after day after day, continue to seek the things above, to set your heart on things above. Don't forget that. It doesn't just happen in a one-off prayer. We have to keep on doing this. Jesus knew that. Of course he did. Wisest man who ever lived. See what he says in Matthew 6? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. See, if our focus is on things that will ultimately rust and tarnish and break down and burn up, our energy and our emotions are going to be misplaced. But if we set our focus on Jesus and allow him to become our ultimate treasure, our hearts are going to follow. So we set our hearts on him. We look to him. You with me? This is one of them sermons, isn't it? Yeah? You're getting a bit wavery? Ah, hey, we're done watching you, boy. This is the reality that Christians must appreciate. And if you're checking Christianity out, this is the reality of what Christianity can do. If you don't believe me, come and talk to me afterwards. Come and talk to these guys. Come and talk to several other people here who've experienced this for themselves. If our focus is in the wrong place, we'll get it wrong. Look up. Set your hearts on things above. Paul continues. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is is seated at the right hand of God. Now, knowing that Christ is seated at the right hand of God provides a much-needed reminder that Jesus is the boss. He's in control. He's returning here, isn't he, Paul, to his original theme. He's saying Jesus is supreme. It echoes another verse in the Bible, doesn't it? This idea where Christ is seated the right hand of God. You remember Psalm 110? The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand and I will make your enemies a footstool at your your feet. The most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. That's it. That's it. Jesus is exalted and sits at the right hand of the Father, which shows us that his saving work is complete. Look up. Look up. 
Consider him. Look to Jesus. That's our first imperative, isn't it? Set our hearts on things above. Look up. The second thing that we have to see is that we are to set our minds on things above, not on earthly things. Remember the guy in the candid camera thing? He's looking around with his face to the ground. He's concentrating on what's going on down here. It literally translates that bit as keep on thinking as a matter of habit on things above, not on things down here on earth. Well, I failed there. Because I need to be honest with you. That's hard. I mean, I get up in the morning, my, you know, we have a prayer time together as a Christian couple. Every morning we pray together, but it's not the first thing I do. I've got to be honest with you. And uh, there are days when we don't. And I find it difficult sometimes when I'm preoccupied with different things regarding my work. Or maybe something happens in the family and sometimes earthly things consume my interest. Can you identify with that? I mean, that's the reality. But here's the challenge. We need to be looking up and we need to be focused on Jesus, not on earthly things. It literally translates, keep thinking as a matter of habit. See, our feet have got to be on the earth. We've got to have our feet on the ground, for goodness sake. You know, these Christians who are swinging from the chandeliers and thinking everything's rosy, come on. I'm happy to swing from chandeliers, but I know not everything's rosy. Have I lost you? You know, you've got to have your feet on the ground. We live in the real world. People get ill. We pray for them. Sometimes people die. Christians get divorced. I mean, it, it happens. That's the real world in which we live. But our minds have got to be more focused on heaven. We've got to be thinking about how our thoughts influence our actions. If we place our thoughts above and not on earth, our behavior is going to reflect what matters to God. I think the sin I see in my life very often is because I'm not looking enough to him. I'm so preoccupied with what's going on down here. It takes tenacious effort. It's blinking hard work. Because we tend to look down by nature instead of looking up. But if we fix our gaze on things above, God will change us. And if we change our mind, God is going to change our heart. He spells it out in Philippians chapter 4. Do you remember that uh, passage? Whatever is true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think. That's what he says, think about such things. By seeking what Jesus desires, it'll help us. Where are you looking? You got Jesus in focus? You looking up? You're focused on him? Well, in verses 3 and 4, as we bring things to a close this evening, we see why it's good to look up. Reasons are given. I mean, the first thing is very clear. We died. We died. Back to the cross where we died in Christ. When Jesus Christ died on the cross as an historical event over 2,000 years ago, something happened for eternity. It meant that when Mark Owen became a Christian in 1979, I was able to take that event and make it apply to my life. That when Jesus died, he took my sin upon me, upon himself, on that cross. I have got no obligation to live like I used to. I have died with Christ. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's it. We died with Christ. And as such, we should have as little desire for improper worldly pleasures as a dead person would have. When you become a Christian, you don't just receive a cosmetic makeover. 
You don't simply get a Christian veneer. You don't walk into a chapel and get a spray tan called Christianity. Well, some people behave as if that's what it is. It changes you. You have to be renewed. You have to be transformed, reformed. No, you don't actually. You've got to be put to death. The old self's got to die. We've died. That's what Paul says. We died. You died. Look what he says then. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Wow. To have our lives hidden with the one who is seated at the right hand of God gives us a lot of satisfaction, a lot of peace, and a lot of security. Would you agree with that? Yeah, there's a guy looking out for me, and for you. His name is Jesus. My life is hidden in him. The image here is of treasure stored away in a secure place. It's like a seed buried in the earth. Our real lives are often hidden from the world, only to be revealed when Jesus returns. I don't know about you, but our new life as a Christian is often a complete mystery to those who don't understand spiritual matters. Do you find that? Some of you who are fairly new Christians, do you have some of your family and some of your friends going, you what? Do you get people just scratching their heads going, huh? Some of my unbelieving family and friends just don't get it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Third, Christ is our life. Look at it. See, you died. Your life's hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears. In a very real sense, for the Christian, Jesus is what life is all about. Without him, where would I be? Where would you be, some of you, without Jesus? I'll tell you where I would still be. I would still be like the guy walking that pavement. I would still be looking. I would still be searching. I'd probably still be desperate. I was desperate when I became a Christian. And I'd certainly be dead in my sin. But in John 14, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. See, by realizing that Jesus is our life, we can have a new attitude about anything that happens to us. If he's truly our life, stuff changes. We've got nothing to fear. Fourth thing. There you go. You died. Your life's hidden with Christ. Christ, who is your life, appears. Whoa. He's coming back. Shall I say that again? He's coming back. We we don't hear that said much today. Why? Because people go, you are. They don't understand. But he's coming back. If he's coming back, it only makes sense that we should be looking up, doesn't it? Tony Campolo said, I don't know when he's coming back because I'm not on the organizing committee. But when he comes, I'll be on the welcoming committee. Yeah. Maybe he'll come tonight. I don't know. Anybody here got inside knowledge on it? Please tell me. Because I don't know when. So, because I don't know when, I need to be looking. See, the phrase, when. See? The phrase, when is an interesting one. Jesus is coming again, and we need to understand that he is. You died. Your life is hidden. When Christ, who is your life, appears. That's the thing. It's like whenever. Whenever. You don't know. I don't know. But the fact of his return is certain. Amen? Yeah, the fact is, for the time, I ain't got a clue. Finally, five. You will also appear with him in glory. Wow. That's amazing. Okay. Don't worry, I'm going to stop. I'll give you permission to go on and on and on. The verb appear here means to make visible 
what's invisible. When Jesus returns, you'll be found out. Do you know that? Whether or not you are a true believer will come to light. Whether or not you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior will be made clear. You can be a pastor, but not have given your life to Jesus. You can be a deacon, a church secretary. You can be a member of the church. You can be faithful in your attendance for 50 years. The question is not anything to do with that. It's whether you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And when he comes back, everything will be made visible. And if you are a Christian, it says there, you also will appear with him in glory. We will be transformed, won't we? 1 John 3, verse 2. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Paul is urging us, friends, in the opening verses of chapter 3, to look up. Look up. Look up. Remember who we are. Remember who you were? Yeah. But remember who you will be as well when Jesus returns. Where are you looking? Where are you looking this evening? Where does your mind focus on? What gets the attention of your heart? We have to make a conscious, deliberate, and daily decision to look up and to set our minds and our hearts on things above. Can I encourage you this week to do that? To deliberately think about these things? To keep your heart and your mind in the right place? Because I'm telling you now, it'll determine where you end up. Next week, we'll move on and see that as well as looking up, we need to look out. But for tonight, let's look up and see him in all his glory. Amen.